By the time Hitler came to power in 1933, his thoughts on the future of armored warfare had already been widely published in the Nazi press. He had a keen interest in the tank and placed its development high up on his list of priorities. When German rearmament began in earnest, plans were made to produce an entire range of armored fighting vehicles. This was based largely on the philosophies of Heinz Guderian, a veteran of the First World War and chief of staff to the inspector of motorized troops. Guderian had long since recognized the full potential of the tank. If allowed to operate at its own speed, instead of being hindered by the slowness of the troops, the tank could provide the ideal means of avoiding static trench warfare. In a series of exercises and motorized war games, Guderian had demonstrated that mobile armored divisions could win a modern war in the shortest possible time. Two main types of tank were envisaged by the German general staff. The first would carry a 37 mm high velocity anti-tank gun and would be deployed in large numbers to form the bulk of an armored assault. The second type would be a medium tank weighing some 20 tons. Equipped with the largest 75 mm gun firing high explosive shells, it would act in support of the lighter vehicle. The Panzer III and Panzer IV would eventually fulfill these two roles, but their development and production took much longer than expected. In the meantime, two small lighter tanks were used to fill the gap. These were the 5.5 ton Panzer I and the 10 ton Panzer II. With relatively weak firepower and thin defensive armor, they were hardly suitable as battle tanks, but they were the ideal vehicles for training and reconnaissance work. The Panzer I was one of the smallest tanks ever built, measuring just 13 feet in length and less than 7 feet in width. Armed with two 7.92 mm MG-34 machine guns, it had an operational range of over 100 miles and in spite of its low-powered four-cylinder engine, it could reach a top speed of 25 miles per hour on the road. With a crew of only two men, the tank commander also had to act as the gunner. His job was made even more difficult by the very poor visibility from inside the turret. To properly judge what was happening outside the tank, it was usually necessary to stand up through the turret hatch. With the top half of his body exposed, the commander presented an extremely good target for both riflemen and machine gunners. The tank itself was designed to be immune to small arms fire, but its angular construction and thin armor plating rendered it susceptible to any gun of a larger caliber. It entered service in 1934 and was built on a relatively large scale. Before long, several variants had evolved, and between them they formed nearly half of the total tank force. By 1935, the larger Panzer II began to appear in limited numbers. The new vehicle had considerably thicker armor plating, but its 130 horsepower engine enabled it to match the top speed of its predecessor. The addition of a third crewman eased the strain on the commander, enabling him to concentrate fully on directing operations. Armament had been improved by replacing one of the machine guns with a 20 mm cannon. But with limited penetrating power and an effective range of less than 700 yards, the gun was of little use against opposing heavy tanks. Nevertheless, the new tank was well received by its crews. Technisch, yeah. also, also, it was a sehr gutes Fahrzeug, technisch, also von, von maschinell aus gesehen. Er hatte nur einen Nachteil. It was a very good vehicle, technically and mechanically. The only problem was the steering. We had the old heavy steering system. You had to have a lot of strength to move this tank in the direction that you wanted to go because of this strange old steering system. Once you were on a straight road, it was fine, but as soon as you had to go over uneven ground, there were problems. It was hard to maneuver because it was very long, and with this extra size and the belt system, it was harder to handle. 
Aber sonst war er, er wurde eigentlich gern gefahren. Mostly people enjoyed driving the Panzer II. The five-wheel suspension of the Panzer II was a distinct improvement over the external girder system used on the Panzer I. The elliptical springing on each wheel was far more effective than the previous layout and gave the occupants a much better ride. By 1935, compulsory military service had been introduced in Germany. In October, the first three Panzer divisions were formed, together with their own specialized Panzer command. The tactics and training methods used by the divisions were based on Guderian's two main principles of tank fighting. The first of these was that the tanks themselves should play the primary role, while all other weapons should be used to support them. Tank divisions would be used in concentrated thrusts in order to break through and isolate the enemy's positions. By using speed and surprise, the tanks would become the single most decisive factor in any major offensive. The second principle involved a system of close cooperation between German aircraft and armor. Pinpoint bombing should be used to clear a path for the tanks and to eliminate any points of resistance. To enable them to fight along these lines, the first Panzer divisions were very carefully structured. Each one consisted of a Panzer brigade with two tank regiments and a motorized rifle brigade with one motorcycle battalion and two rifle battalions. Other divisional units included artillery, reconnaissance and anti-tank battalions, as well as engineering companies and signal battalions. Communications equipment became an integral part of the system, and on Guderian's insistence, every tank was fitted with both an intercom and a radio. During the opening part of the war, this factor would give the Germans a decisive edge over their opponents. Der einzige Vorteil, der neben der guten technischen Beschaffenheit I think one of the advantages was the technical abilities of the tank, in that we had much better communications between our tanks. Each of our tanks had a radio, and therefore could always be in radio contact with the leader or commander. This made it successful, not because of superior armaments, but because of the improved communication facilities. In 1938, Hitler ordered the occupation of Czechoslovakia and seized control of the Czech tank firms of CKD and Skoda. In addition, every tank already in service with the Czech army was absorbed into the Wehrmacht. Most were light tanks, similar in size and performance to the Panzer II. The Czech TNHP tank was redesignated by the Germans as the 38T. Armed with a reliable 37mm gun, it made a sizable contribution to the Panzer force. It served with the Wehrmacht in most of the early war theatres and continued in production until 1942. By 1939, both of the heavier German tanks had completed their acceptance trials. The Panzer III and Panzer IV were officially declared standard issue on September the 27th. The F model was the first major production version of the Panzer III. Weighing 20 tons, it carried a crew of five and had a top road speed of 25 miles per hour. It could reach 11 miles per hour across country and had a maximum range of 110 miles. Inside, the vehicle was relatively roomy when compared with its smaller predecessors. The driver and radio operator both sat inside the hull, while the commander, gunner and loader were all positioned in the turret. Visibility was extremely good, and the commander had no less than five vision slots equally spaced around the rim of the turret cupola. Yet in spite of its good points, the first production version had some serious shortcomings. Armor plating was far too thin, and the 37mm main gun proved unable to penetrate the hulls of contemporary enemy tanks. But the basic design was sound, and the construction methods used enabled improvements to be made without any major problems. 
Before long, the 37mm gun had been replaced by a more powerful 50mm weapon, and bolt-on armor had been developed for both the hull and the turret. The additional protection would make quite a difference in the forthcoming battles. Ja, der Vorteil war dadurch einmal schon die stärkere Panzerung. Panzerung, die war schon bedeutend. Also man fühlte sich sicherer da drin. Das war also the advantage was the strong armor plating. Muss ich ehrlich sagen, man uh, entwickelte auch dann etwas mehr Mut, soll ich mal sagen. It was much better, and so you felt safer, and it made you feel braver, as you knew your chances of getting hit were a lot less. Selbsterhaltungstrieb erhalten dass man äh, mit den vorgehenden Panzer zu sehr in der Gefahr bestanden, also zu leicht abgeschossen. So, as I said before, I was hit three times. Wie ich schon sagte, drei Treffer gekriegt habe, die waren alle drei nicht durch, die waren alle drei... Äh, I can still picture it. Ich habe hier noch ein Bild festgehalten, das waren so, so wie eine Rose sahen, die, aus, die Aufschläge... It looked like a problem, but the tank was all right. Wenn ich auf das Technische kommen möchte, mit Panzer 3... With regard to the technical performance of the Panzer 3, I would say that it was a well-constructed vehicle. Mechanically, in view of its tracks, it was not as vulnerable as some other types, because it had running belts, and if anything got caught, it could easily cut through it. I can't say too much about the technical aspect of it, because as a gunner, I was responsible for loading the weapons. Richtschütze, Ladeschütze, Richtschütze gewesen. Overall, the Panzer III was an unqualified success. It dominated the early tank battles, and for the first three years of war, it played a decisive part in almost every German victory. By the time production ceased in 1943, more than five and a half thousand had been built. Running in parallel with the Panzer III, came the introduction of Germany's standard support tank, the Panzer IV. It weighed three tons more than the fighting tank and used a longer chassis in order to accommodate the larger 75mm main gun. In spite of the extra weight, it could reach the same road speed as the Panzer III and was even slightly faster over rough ground. Eight-wheel suspension gave a comfortable ride and the internal layout was good, with the hull being divided into three separate compartments. Periscopes were fitted for both the driver and the radio operator, and the turret could be operated either electrically or by hand. The front superstructure was made from a single piece of metal, and the thickness of the basic armor was increased from 30 millimeters to 50 millimeters. But the plating was still too thin to cope with heavy opposition, and during the early campaigns, Panzer IVs were unable to carry out their support roles properly. When the deficiencies were exposed, the army instigated a lengthy program of improvements. Thicker armor was added, and after 1941, most models were fitted with the long-barreled version of the 75mm gun. This new weapon transformed the vehicle to such an extent that it superseded the Panzer III as Germany's main fighting tank. It proved extremely reliable throughout the war and became one of the few tanks to remain in continuous production from 1939 right through to 1945. When it was upgunned for a second time in 1943, it had the ability to take on almost any contemporary Allied tank. By the time production ceased, nearly 9,000 Panzer III's had been built. As the medium tanks were phased into service, the number of Panzer divisions increased accordingly. By the autumn of 1939, three more had been formed, and on September the 1st, all six divisions took part in the invasion of Poland. Of the 3,000 German tanks involved, 98 were Panzer III's and 211 were Panzer IVs. The remainder of the force was made up of Panzer I's and II's, together with a number of Czech-built 38Ts. Facing them were 1,100 outdated Polish tanks of all shapes and sizes. Codenamed Operation White, the invasion began at 4.45 in the morning. 
two German army groups struck simultaneously, one in the north and the other in the south. As soon as the ground attack began, the Luftwaffe launched a series of massive airstrikes against the Polish airfields. The Polish Air Force consisted of just a few hundred obsolete aircraft, and within a few days, it had been all but demolished. On the ground, the Poles were equally ill-equipped. They were desperately lacking in mobile anti-tank guns and were completely outclassed by the speed of the Panzers. Nevertheless, they fought with astonishing bravery and even resorted to using cavalry units in an attempt to hold up the German armor. By the end of the month, it was all over. Warsaw had been completely surrounded in just 18 days, and on the 28th of September, the Polish capital was forced to surrender. The Panzer divisions had proved their worth, losing little more than 200 tanks during the entire Polish campaign. Eight months later, they were poised to repeat their success. By the spring of 1940, Hitler had two and a half thousand tanks at his disposal. Panzer IIs and IIs made up 40% of this force, while the heavier Panzer IIs and IVs accounted for less than 25%. Each Panzer division now included its own anti-aircraft battalion, as well as its own squadron of nine reconnaissance planes. By cooperating closely with the division's tank formations, these units were to prove highly effective in the coming campaigns. Training methods had now reached a state of near perfection. The tankmen were taught the advantages of teamwork and versatility, and each member of a crew was able to operate as a driver, gunner, loader, or as a radio operator. Normally, the crew would be one unit. There wasn't any difference between ranks within the unit, which was rather unusual for the German armed forces. For example, even the commander had to help with carrying the canisters of ammunition to the camp, regardless of his rank, just as the wireless operator and any other soldier had to do. The driver was the only one that didn't have to help as he had to drive all day long and repair any damage done to the tank. But all the rest chipped in. The wireless operator organized the food. He made sandwiches and looked after all the food side of things. On May the 10th, Hitler ordered the start of Operation Yellow, the invasion of France and the Low Countries. Opposing the German armor were 4,000 British and French tanks, plus a small number of Belgian and Dutch vehicles. Although the French had a number of the fairly potent Char B tank, much of their force was equipped with inadequately armed light tanks, such as the Renault 35 and the Hotchkiss H-39. Britain and France were both convinced that the Germans would attack in the north. The Maginot Line and the thick forests of the Ardennes would surely prevent a breakthrough further south. So when Hitler struck in Holland and Belgium, the Allies moved northwards and took up a pre-planned defensive position on the Dial Line. The German offensive opened early in the morning, with the Luftwaffe attacking airfields in Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg and France. Meanwhile, paratroops were landed at Rotterdam and The Hague, while additional airborne forces attacked Fort Eban Mail, the key defensive position in Belgium. By midday on May the 11th, the fort had surrendered and the panzers of Army Group B had pushed deep into Holland and Belgium. While the Allies were decoyed into fighting in the north, Hitler launched the real attack further south, 
straight through the supposedly impenetrable Ardennes. On May the 13th, von Kleist's tanks of Army Group A smashed across the River Meuse, forcing a gap between Sedan and Dinan to the north of the Maginot Line. With the main French defensive system rendered completely useless, the Allied armies were rapidly outflanked. By May the 17th, Army Group A's panzers were racing westwards across France. Three French tank divisions under the command of Charles de Gaulle counterattacked a Montcornet. But in spite of support from British armor, they could do little to stem the tide. And by May the 20th, Guderian's tanks had reached the coast at Abbeville. Soon they began to swing to the north, and by May the 24th, the Allies were encircled in a coastal pocket some 60 miles long. Faced with a hopeless situation, the British decided to withdraw on Dunkirk and evacuate as many troops as possible. Hitler's nervousness came to their aid. Worried about an overextended line, he halted the German panzers on the edge of the Ahr Canal. And in a nine-day rescue operation, a third of a million Allied troops managed to escape to England. The Battle of France continued for almost another three weeks, but the result was inevitable. After a brief rest, the panzers swung south. Paris fell on the 14th of June, and eight days later, France surrendered. It had been a resounding victory for the Panzer divisions and a triumph of German military planning. Holland had been conquered in just four days, Belgium in three weeks, and the whole of France within seven weeks. In September, Italy opened the first offensive against British forces in North Africa. The following month, they invaded Greece, but by the end of the year, they were in serious trouble in both war zones. The Greeks forced a retreat to Albania, and in December, four Italian divisions were wiped out in a British counterattack at Sidi Barani. Early in the new year, the British 7th Armoured Division took Tobruk. Within two months, they had destroyed 10 Italian divisions and captured 130,000 men. When most of the British force was transferred to Greece, Hitler decided to go to Mussolini's aid. In February, the newly formed Africa Corps were landed at Tripoli, and under the command of Erwin Rommel, they began to prepare for their first major offensive in North Africa. German forces also invaded Yugoslavia and Greece, and by the end of the month, both countries had surrendered. At 3.15 a.m. on June the 22nd, Operation Barbarossa began with more than 3,000 panzers spearheading the invasion of Russia. In a series of well-timed attacks, the Luftwaffe destroyed much of the Soviet Air Force while it was still on the ground. By July, German pilots had claimed more than 4,000 Russian aircraft for the loss of less than 200 of their own machines. Within a few short weeks, the Panzer divisions had enveloped five Russian armies and had taken several hundred thousand prisoners. But in the autumn, the Germans had begun to encounter a new threat in the form of the Soviet medium tank, the T-34. Armed with a powerful 76mm gun and with a road speed of 50 km per hour, the much heavier T-34 completely outclassed the Panzer IV. As we marched into Russia, they showed us big posters of all the different types of tank, but none of the T-34. 
It wasn't there, so we didn't know about it. Well, we said, we've got good protection and that's how we went into it. We were told it would all start in six to eight weeks and to get ready for it. But we learned after the second day, after fighting the T-34 and being hit by it, that you couldn't get out of the tank in the time you had. The T-34 had a strong impact. In the face of powerful tanks like the T-34, the Wehrmacht's standard Panzer IV proved to be completely out of date. Germany reacted by speeding up the development of its own heavy battle tanks, the Panzer V Panther and the Panzer VI Tiger, but neither would be ready for at least another year. In the meantime, the divisions fighting in the east pressed on with their existing equipment. The initial three-pronged German attack was aimed at Leningrad in the north, Smolensk in the center, and Kiev in the south. Smolensk fell in August, followed by Kiev at the end of September. In three months, the Russians had been pushed back several hundred miles, and in the process, they had lost vast numbers of men, tanks, and guns. German losses had also been high, especially in the Russian minefields. Panzer III und der Panzer IV hatte in der Wanne unten eine Lücke. Die konnte man so auch machen. Die war etwa so groß. The Panzers III and IV had an opening in the round flap. We used to call it our pee hole. When we drove for days on end and didn't have time to do our business anywhere, we used it as a toilet. Anyway, we were driving along, and one of these mines landed on top of the flap. You can imagine what happened. There was not much left. My wireless operator sat on the right at the front, and the man that supplied the ammunition stood right on the top of the flap. It ripped his back off, his legs off, and my legs were injured. The lieutenant who was at the front seemed to be all right. But later he got shot in the head by the infantry and died. The other two were alive still. It's horrendous to witness a thing like that. They were screaming, screaming for half an hour. The driver and myself got dragged out and had to sit on top of the tracks. The infantry was still there and we happened to sit on a blind spot. The tank was completely wrecked. The only thing left was the top. That wasn't damaged. The tank cans that the Russians had were also dangerous. They were long things that buried into the soil. They would fire within a short range of 100, 150 to 200 meters, and they would go through everything. They would shoot upwards and blow the tops off us. So we would be driving along for ages in our tanks without a breakdown, when suddenly they were just blown up. The impact was very fast and effective. If you got hit, there wasn't much you could do. It was rather an unpleasant experience. We had a lot of respect for the tank cans. They would rip through anything. We managed to get hold of one, and I must confess, we were quite impressed by it. Whoever fired them must have had very strong shoulders. I still admire those who had to handle them and fire the tank cans. By the end of September, Hitler sensed that his ultimate objectives were at last within sight. On the last day of the month, Army Group Center began its drive on Moscow. 
But the German panzers had reached the pinnacle of their success, and in October 1941, the Russian weather turned against them. Torrential rain turned the roads into quagmires. As temperatures fell, the rain turned to snow, and keeping the tanks running became extremely difficult. Ja, in Russland kann ich nur sagen, von der Instandsetzung her, es gab ja keine Unterkünfte. Wir haben also We would stop anywhere, under the open sky, in a field, or underneath a few trees. It didn't matter if it was day or night as you worked in shifts. Usually, there were three men, one of whom would be sleeping. You always had to make sure that the division had their tanks repaired as quickly as possible. Even if it meant working in temperatures of, say, minus 30 or 40 centigrade, you had to get on with it. By the end of the year, the Russians had begun to launch a series of massive counterattacks. In the vast Soviet expanse, the German supply lines became stretched to the limit. Shortage of fuel and lack of air support became decisive factors, and the thick armor of the heavy Russian tanks forced the panzers to fight at close range. Also, when man zum Erfolg kommen wollte, wenn ich das so nennen darf, wenn man also einen russischen Panzer abschießen wollte, dann musste man schon sehr nah herankommen. If you wanted to be successful at shooting down the Russian tanks, you had to make sure that you were close enough. You had to come out of hiding. Sometimes you were camouflaged. It was best to attack head on. And it would be difficult to shoot the enemy further than 600 to 800 meters away. It was easier to get close up from the side. We didn't bother to target the turret. We would go for the tracks. We had various types of ammunition, and it was important to choose the right one at the right time. It wasn't easy. As the push towards Moscow ground slowly to a halt, Hitler ordered his armies to go on the defensive. Meanwhile, the first clashes between German and British tanks had already taken place in North Africa. The situation had swayed to and fro, but after a pause of several months, Rommel launched his second major offensive in January 1942. By the end of the month, he had captured Benghazi, and after another lull in the fighting, he began a long drive towards Tobruk. At the Battle of Gazala, newly arrived American-built tanks inflicted heavy losses on the German armor. The M3 Grant's twin-gun armament came as a nasty shock and finally gave the British a weapon capable of matching the Panzer IV. Nevertheless, Rommel pressed on, and on June the 21st, he stormed Tobruk, taking 32,000 prisoners plus all of their equipment. Four days later, the remainder of the British Eighth Army withdrew to El Alamein, the last defensive position before Alexandria. While reserves were brought in from Egypt, morale was boosted by the appearance of a new commander, General Bernard Montgomery. On August the 30th, Rommel attacked at Alam Halfa. The British were well prepared, and within 48 hours the German panzers had bogged down in an extensive range of minefields. While Montgomery's strength continued to build, Rommel's was eroded by shortages of both fuel and supplies. By October, the British had gained overwhelming superiority in men, tanks, aircraft and guns.
At 9 p.m. on the 23rd, Montgomery opened the Battle of El Alamein with the greatest artillery barrage since World War I. The artillery fire and air bombardment took the Germans by surprise, smashing their communications and paving the way for a British armored assault. The ensuing battle lasted for 14 days and marked the combat debut of the most prolific medium tank of all, the M4 Sherman. We were the Sherman from the Waffe her überlegen. Our weapons were much better than the Sherman's, but we had a lot of respect for the Sherman. When it was introduced for the first time, we realized how vulnerable we were. In the early days, I think we were ahead of the English technically, but the story changed at Alamein when the Sherman was used for the first time ever. I wasn't there then. As I said, we respected the Sherman completely. By November the 6th, the Battle of Alamein had ended in a resounding victory for the British. Montgomery's 8th Army had broken through the German positions and by November the 2nd, Rommel was in full retreat. With the loss of 30,000 men, 400 cannon and 350 tanks, the Afrika Panzer Army was no longer an effective fighting force. By the late spring of 1942, the German armies in Russia were preparing for a new offensive against Stalingrad and the oil fields of the Caucasus. Many units began to receive the much improved F2 version of the Panzer IV. Nach Deutschland verlegt, um den Panzer IV mit der Langrohrkanone zu kriegen. Nach einer kurzen Ausbildungszeit we were moved to Germany to take over the Panzer IV with the long gun. After a short period of training, our section was moved to the 4th Tank Regiment in the south to support the Caucasus campaign. This was the most interesting period of all my war missions. The landscape, as well as the battles, were not particularly difficult. The Russian defense fell back onto the Caucasus. We had problems with our tanks, which were really built to fight in Middle Europe. In these conditions, desert landscapes, it was very difficult to operate these tanks. By September, the Germans had reached the outskirts of Stalingrad. But in the face of a defensive system that was several miles deep, their advance ground to a halt. Further north at Leningrad, the world's most powerful tank went into battle for the first time. Weighing 55 tons, the Tiger could outgun and outrange any existing Allied tank. Its armor plating was so strong that the hull was virtually impenetrable from the front. The high-velocity 88mm main gun was a truly formidable weapon, feared and respected by all Allied tank groups. Based on the original Flak 36, the tank-mounted version could penetrate 100 millimeters of armor from well over 1,500 meters. I remember a conversation with a friend of mine who had seen this type of tank before, and when I came back from leave, I asked him, what does this tank, which we have heard so many wonderful things about, look like? My friend Heiner Kleiner said, I imagine a tank with a very long gun. He asked if I could picture it and said, but this one is much longer. When I first saw the tank, I was a little disappointed. I had imagined it to be more elegant, a bit like the T-34. But here it was, this great big dinosaur in front of us. Square, vertical form, powerful. But the gun was very impressive. 
gewaltig, aber die Kanone war imponierend. The debut of the Tiger proved little short of disastrous. Hitler had insisted on using the new tanks at the first opportunity, but the marshy terrain and forest tracks near Leningrad forced them to drive in single file. As a result, the Russian anti-tank gunners were able to knock them out one by one. Most of the Tigers were destroyed before they could use their powerful 88mm guns with any real effect. But in spite of this inauspicious start, the very appearance of a Tiger on the battlefield was enough to shake the morale of its opponents. To the crews of lighter Allied tanks, it appeared almost invincible, and before long, it had built up a formidable reputation. But on the Eastern Front, the tide was about to turn. Hitler's offensive in the Caucasus dragged on into winter, and in December, the Russians relieved Stalingrad. In the new year, a series of massive Soviet thrusts inflicted devastating losses on the 4th and 6th Panzer armies. Six months later, Hitler launched Operation Citadel, his last major effort in the East. Aimed at destroying Soviet forces in the vital Kursk salient, this large-scale offensive became the most decisive battle on the entire Eastern Front. During seven days of continuous fighting, a combined total of six and a half thousand tanks and assault guns were involved. The Battle of Kursk marked the first appearance of Germany's second heavy tank, the Panzer V Panther. Although twice the weight of the Panzer IV, it was considerably faster and had a much better level of armor protection. Der Vorteil beim Panther zunächst, der war, dass wir eine relativ starke Frontpanzerung hatten und eine recht gute One of the advantages of the Panther was that it had relatively strong armor plating on the front and quite a good gun, the 7.5 cm gun L71, which was superior to the Russian 762. Die Möglichkeit jetzt nicht mehr auf nächste Entfernung, sondern bis zur Entfernung 1000 m und auch noch weiter it enabled us to shoot down heavy Russian tanks up to a distance of 1,000 meters. Panther, we lag aber darin, dass seine Reichweite, seine Einsatzreichweite. The disadvantages with the Panther were the lack of distance it could travel because of carrying insufficient fuel supplies, and also problems with the power propulsion unit were rather substantial. Und am Laufwerk relativ groß waren. So that is why we suffered such high losses on the early missions, mainly through technical difficulties. Durch Feindeinwirkung war da war die Verluste an und für sich geringer. Der Panther selbst war also ein Fahrzeug, das uns äh, eigentlich gefehlt hatte und ich glaube, es ist wohl äh, anerkanntermaßen ist es The Panther was a good tank. We liked it. In seiner Zeit beste Panzer gewesen, der überhaupt I think that it was the best tank around then. Er hatte einige Nachteile, die aufgrund von there were a few disadvantages due to it being designed so quickly and the lack of resources available. The engine was good, but was perhaps a little too weak for its size. This was the main disadvantage, and we suffered many losses because of it. A third of the Panthers were lost. During a retreat, we didn't always have time to tow damaged tanks back with us, so we had to leave them behind and blow them up. Citadel opened at 5 a.m. With more than two and a half thousand Panzers deployed over a 60-mile front, it was the largest tank battle in history. Within hours of advancing in the north, the 9th Panzer Army had destroyed an entire wave of T-34s and had captured the village of Botyrki. 
A simultaneous attack in the south breached the Soviet lines, and by the late afternoon, the panzers had captured the key village of Cherkeskoye. But the Russians had been expecting this battle for a very long time, and had turned the entire area into a veritable fortress. Concealed within the multi-layered defense system were 3,000 miles of trenches, 25,000 guns and mortars, and more than 40,000 anti-tank and anti-personnel mines. As the battle progressed, both sides suffered enormous losses, and within a few days, the salient was littered with burnt-out tanks and guns. Successive German attacks were repulsed one after another until finally the Russians counterattacked at Orel. The crisis point came on July the 12th with the final German assault on Prokhorovka. 900 Russian tanks defended the town against 900 panzers. With both Russian and Germans firing at point-blank range, the carnage was appalling and by nightfall, more than 700 tanks had been destroyed. Among them were 300 panzers, including 70 tigers. On July the 13th, Hitler called off the offensive and the Battle of Kursk was over. Russia had lost 50% of its tank strength, but the German advance had at last been halted. For the rest of the war on the Eastern Front, Hitler's panzer armies would be permanently on the defensive. As the Russians advanced in the East, the Allies at last opened a second front in the West. It began with the invasion of Italy, and continued nine months later with the main assault in Normandy. By midnight on June the 6th, 150,000 had come ashore, equipped with a variety of vehicles, including mine-clearing flail tanks and bridge-laying Shermans. After a slow start, the Germans reacted by sending 10 panzer divisions to defend the vital communication center at Caen. Two months of heavy fighting followed before the town fell to the Allies. In August, the Americans finally broke out at St. Lo. Sweeping round in an arc, they linked up with the Canadians and caught the 5th and 7th Panzer armies in a trap at Falaise. It was a catastrophe for the Germans. A relentless air onslaught annihilated the Panzer divisions. Out of the 500 German tanks at Falaise, only 60 managed to escape. 60,000 men were either killed or taken prisoner, and the cost to the Germans in other materials was enormous. On August the 25th, French and American tanks drove into Paris amidst scenes of wild jubilation. As the Allies began their long advance to the Rhine, Germany's ultimate heavy tank made its first appearance in battle. Known as the King Tiger, it carried the thickest armor and was the heaviest and most powerfully armed tank of the entire war. Equipped with the 88mm L71, it was 24 feet long and was capable of destroying any armored vehicle at a range of 2,000 yards. In total, nearly 500 King Tigers entered service with the German army. Used correctly, they were virtually invincible, and wherever they appeared in numbers, they completely dominated the battlefield. Their immensely strong armor made them almost invulnerable to gunfire and a single King Tiger was quite capable of engaging and destroying several Allied tanks at the same time. At the Battle of Arnhem in September 1944, the 2nd SS Panzer Corps, with two King Tiger battalions, played the decisive role in cutting off the British 1st Airborne Division. In just nine days, they had completely crushed Montgomery's plans for shortening the war in the West.
three months later, on December the 16th, Hitler launched Operation Autumn Mist, his last major attempt at halting the Allied advance. Two armies with a quarter of a million men and 1,800 tanks were used in a massive surprise counterattack through the Ardennes. The German objective was to drive an armored wedge between the British and American armies. By forcing their way through to the Belgian coast, the Panzers would retake Antwerp, sever the main routes of supply, and force the Allies to withdraw. The attack came at the weakest point of the Allied line, with the German forces outnumbering the opposing Americans by nearly three to one. As usual, the heavy tank units of the 5th and 6th Panzer armies spearheaded the attack, using Tiger Ones and King Tigers. At first, it looked as if the plan might succeed. In the foggy weather conditions, the Allies were unable to call in airstrikes. And during the first 24 hours, the 5th Panzer Army advanced 20 miles through the American lines. But on December the 23rd, the weather cleared and the Allied air forces were deployed en masse. Panzer Army was pushed back across. When the Americans reached the River Rhine in March 1945, the 512th Battalion's Jagd Tiger Companies were sent into action against the bridgehead at Remagen. But it was a hopeless situation, and by the end of the month, they had been withdrawn to the north, together with the rest of the German armor trapped inside the Ruhr pocket. The heyday of the Panzer was finally over. Thank <laughs> you.